Hi, everyone. Opal and I were talking earlier about how being in the middle of a book, finishing a book really, is such an all-consuming thing that really what one wants to do, and that's where I am right now, is finishing a book, what one wants to do is just take some time off and think about something else. So with that, I'm going to read to you from something that's not my book. <laughs> from a story called Minefields. But aren't you grateful you were able to immigrate to this country? Yes, yes, of course. It's just that sometimes I don't feel like myself here. Why not? You're free. You can do anything you want. I can't explain it. It's, it's a sense of unease. Everybody probably feels that way when you have to leave the country, right? I don't know. Whenever I get on this bus to go to work and everyone is silent, I think of the taxis in Tehran. Taxis are shared like the buses here, like this bus. I remember once a man got into my taxi who lost a limb. How sad. Well, it's pretty common. Someone in the taxi asked the man what had happened, and he told us he had lost his leg when a mine blew up under him during the Iran Iraq War. <clears throat> the man sitting in front thanked him for his service, and we all chimed in. Then the veteran told us that he had just lost his job at a glue factory because his employer had gone bankrupt, and that his daughter was diabetic and he didn't have money to pay for an insulin. He called on God for help, and by then everyone in the taxi was wiping away tears, including the driver. Oh, sounds like he was a con artist. If you had been there, you would have thought differently. So, what did you do? An old woman sitting next to me promised she would say some prayers for him at the shrine of the seat. The man up front handed him some money. I gave him a book for his daughter that I just bought for my niece's birthday. Cab driver wouldn't accept his fare. When the veteran left, he was still wiping tears from his face, but the lines on his forehead had softened. Really? Are you listening to me? Sure. For a moment, we're able to help that family. No one talks to me here when I take the bus to work. Do you see what I mean? I suppose I do. It's so different here. It must be hard for you. I'm glad you understand. No one has understood before. That's what I'm here for. Hey, I have to go. This is my stop. Wait, I wish I knew you. I wish I could meet you. I wish the same. But you're nobody. You're the American I talk to in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Nina got off the bus in downtown Mill Valley and walked to her workplace at a converted Victorian house that had been painted purple and lime green. The sign outside the house said, Dan's Digestives, in a friendly homey font that had been developed in the 1950s for doctor's offices. Nina walked through the door to the soothing jangle of Tibetan bells, chosen like everything else in the office to make patients feel more relaxed. She said good morning to Rebecca, a college intern who served as a receptionist, before sitting down at her desk and storing her purse. Five people worked for the company, plus the nutritionists, Ayurvedic therapists, and masseuses who dropped in to help clients address their digestive disorders. Minu was the company's artist. She worked part-time drawing stomach products to make them look comforting and wholesome. <laughs> when she first started working at the company, Minu had been surprised to learn that one out of six Americans suffer from digestive disorders. The owners, Dan and Angelica, had been frank in describing the problems experienced by their clients. Constipation, diarrhea, bloating, gas, yeast infections, food rotting in the stomach, often without obvious causes. The gut, Dan explained, is like a mini brain. If things were wrong with an individual psyche, things could easily go wrong with the gut. And who didn't have things wrong with their psyche? And his wife both <laughs> suffered from stomach stress, and they had decided to devote their lives to take, taking care of those with similar problems. Dan was the idea man, with straight shoulder length brown hair and a quiet manner. And Hilika made the business decisions in a mixture of English and Spanish, languages she knew with equal precision. They were in their early 30s and had two young children. As bosses, they believed in a thing called processing. When one of them started to get annoyed with the other, which was happening more and more these days, now that profits were down, they would disappear into the cold, poorly lit conference room until the problem was resolved. They had been good to Mina, but she was careful to stay cheerful around them. She had seen them circle around employees who failed to think positive. One employee had recently been fired. It's survival, Dan had explained somewhat sheepishly. Recession is killing us. <laughs> <laughs>